Well, my name is Don. I'm the associate pastor here. Uh, pastor Adam is away, anticipating he, down in Florida. There's a conference for many of our staff this coming week, and so that's where he is. Um, verse, this might ring a bell. This might sound familiar to you. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Do y'all remember where that verse lives? It's in James. It's in chapter one. It's in chapter one of James. We, we looked at that before. You know, what I was reminded of is I've been, when you have to do this, you've got to study a little deeper. You feel the weight of that a little more. I would encourage you guys, if you're not already, to read and reread James. Even as we kind of listen up and, and we, we hear a portion and a lesson, you know, on a Sunday, read and read, read James. It's a wonderful way to become a true student of the Bible because you know what happens when we do that? This framework just kind of lands, kind of takes, uh, kind of builds in our minds. And we, we, we remember where verses like that live. Remember that in chapter two, it talks about this. And in chapter three, it looks at that. And we, we're, we're, it's a way to kind of let the, the word of God settle deeply into our soul. And man, we will be blessed. We'll not only be able to, to pull up verses and, and remember things when we need them, but the Holy Spirit will pull those verses up for us when somebody else needs them as well. So continue to study. We're gonna get into chapter three today and chapter four. Uh, let me quickly say as well, if you're new to the Vision Virtue series, it is uh, in, in James, maybe you're new to the Bible. Let me tell you really briefly again about who James was. Who's James? Uh, James was a half-brother of Jesus. In the scriptures, you may, may or may not know this, four brothers are named in the Gospels of Jesus. There's James, there's Joseph, Simon, and then Judas, not Iscariot. Sisters are referenced as well, though they're not named. So Jesus was in a big family. He was big brother who did all things well, <laughs> like everything. Yeah, he was the smartest, wisest, morally, you know, can't touch that, right? And so what could possibly go wrong? We've talked a little bit about that in, in the last few weeks. Well, in chapter six of John, we, we see what can go wrong a bit. Jesus has been performing some crazy miracles, uh, feeding 5,000 people at once, walking on the water. The news was getting around, the crowds were swelling and growing, and then he would teach. And some of the things that he said were really hard and, and people were like, I, I'm out of here. And, and it, it actually says that in John. It says many stopped following him because of the harder things that he was saying. And is in that moment, John notes that his brothers also did not believe in him. So Jesus' own family struggled to believe that he was who he said he was. And this appears to have, you know, these collective doubts persist until his death. After his resurrection, Jesus appeared to many people. 10 different occasions are recorded. Lots of people, one time 500 people. Guess who is named specifically in one of those post-resurrection accounts of appearances? James was. Jesus appeared to his brother. And I'll bet it was maybe Thomas-like a little bit. James, it's really me. Check out my hands. Check out my feet. What's really cool is in Acts chapter one, James and his brothers are waiting in the upper room in anticipation for what was promised to them. Jesus died 40 days later, day of Pentecost, Holy Spirit drops on the church. He was part of the crew of the disciples. Mary was there, of course, as well praying, anticipating, asking God to reveal himself again. They were there, which is very cool. And James, we, we talked about before, would succeed Peter in the church in Jerusalem and he would give leadership there for a very long time. He was martyred about 30 years after the death of Jesus. And church historian, second century, really reflected back and, and James was apparently a man of great piety and he was a bold man. And he never apparently left Jerusalem. And that was probably really hard. 
because Jerusalem was not the place where he wanted that church to be. There's a lot of opposition still, the first century especially. Christians paid for their allegiance to Jesus. In fact, every high profile leader except for John, including James, paid for that with their lives. That's a pretty powerful apologetic, by the way, just not to get off on that tangent too far. But here's what it says. It doesn't prove that Jesus rose from the dead or is the son of God and all that, but man, it suggests, it, it does, this is pretty ironclad. All of his followers thought so because they were willing to pay for their faith, their allegiance to Jesus with their lives. James was stoned and, and clubbed to death uh, for his faith in Jesus. And maybe this is the reason, maybe this is the reason that, that James reads kind of intense. <laughs> Remember, he's older, he's seen a lot. He's watched friends die even for the faith. He knows the struggle internally, externally, and I think, and we're gonna look in our, our portions today. It's intense, it really is. And I'm, I'm thinking, well, maybe that was part of his personality, but maybe it was because <coughs> life was intense. In fact, for James, I'm guessing that life felt more like war. I'll bet he felt he was often in a battle. And here's the thing, and we're gonna see this here in a few minutes. We're all in the same war. Life is war. Life is war, it's not a game. I don't think James was thinking ever that it was a game anymore. He's like, no, this is serious. We're gonna be serious when we need to, so let's go. Our proverb for the day is Proverbs 4.23. It says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. It's a perfect proverb to set us up, the portion that James gives us Remember last week, out of the abundance of the heart, what? The mouth speaks. We don't have an explicit verse, but this is what James is gonna say this morning. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mind thinks and we do. Out of the abundance of the heart, it's gonna shape our thinking and it's gonna absolutely inform our actions. So similar uh, things going on here. We're not gonna stand for the reading of the word because it broke it into three sections. James does actually conveniently. It's gonna provide our outline. There are three portions. The first two are set up by questions that he asks and then he answers them. And then the last is just pure application. It's, it's awesome. So that's where we're gonna go. Uh, and he poses this question, John, James 3, 13 through 18. Who is wise and understanding among you? Who is wise and understanding among you? Another way that we could, would say that would be, what does true wisdom look like? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exists, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. James used our new favorite word. Remember the word meek from chapter one? The, the trouble with the word meek for us, right, can, uh, moderns, is that we have a, a different definition. When I think of meek, before I was really kind of going deeper in the scriptures here, meek is what I did not want to be. Meek, me, you know, kind of my understanding, take it was like meek is to kind of recede timidly into the shadows and be a non-player. You know, kind of, for whatever reason, we would just diminish to the place of being invisible. That's not what the biblical definition of meek means. You remember what, what it means? It connotes a, a total lack of hubris, 
to the point of a lack of self-concern, a decided strength of disciplined calmness, in contrast to a more natural blustering self-interest and anger, a decided strength of disciplined calmness, the meekness of wisdom. So he, he's attaching that, that pretty glorious word, very Jesus-like word to this idea of wisdom. Let's push pause for a moment, our first significant point here. Wisdom, according to James, is primarily a character quality. It's a character quality, a morally informed posture of the heart. Wisdom from above, character, heart level. Which is a little surprising to me because when I think of wisdom, I very naturally think, what. Well, well, inquiring of God, asking God for wisdom, whatever, a person bringing wisdom to the table, the conversation, we would think of an ability to, to think on our feet, right? To think strategically, uh, to problem solve. And there is a dimension when we seek wisdom of, that, well, that's true. I mean, there, there is wisdom that drops at times where we're given a word for the moment that helps, right? It's very practical. But what I just said sounds uh, kind of clinical, or like just a, a, an, like an asset, right? According to James, it's not so much about that. It's actually, wisdom is all about the condition of our hearts. It's morally informed. Check out 317. When we read these words in a sentence, we might just kind of like not see them. And so I wanted to, to separate them and pull them out. That is an amazing list. This is what wisdom from above looks like. You can take a moment to look pure, peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy, good fruits, impartial, sincere. Do you know what this sounds like? It sounds like Paul's list in Galatians 5 of the fruit of the Spirit. Just love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. James is giving his list of the fruit of the spirit, the kind of influence that God can have on a human part, that's what it looks like. In Ezekiel, in one of his prophecies, well before this time, prophecy, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I'll remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. We're gonna talk a little bit about how to be filled with the spirit because that's where James goes. But for now, just noting the wisdom from above is the fruit of the spirit, marking a human heart, so that, and, and you notice the, the context we talk about it, there's relational context, so that in relationships, even the most challenging ones, the really hard ones, the contentious ones, we're bringing that to the table. If somebody exhibits any of that in a, in a tough conversation, James would say, that person is wise. There's the wise person in the mix. Listen to them. Who is wise and understanding among you? There's the answer, filled with this kind of fruit. May I encourage you before we move on from this slide, I, I'm gonna try to do this. Pick one of those words, just one, might be overwhelming to choose all of them. Pick one that you're like, for the coming week, that you would love to exhibit in all of your relationships, that you might find is kind of missing in action more often than not. I don't know, just encouragement. We'll, we'll jump to application a little bit. Pick one of those and, and, and write it somewhere so you can pray and remember. Now, if the wisdom from above is admirable and peaceable, the wisdom from below pushes back and says, seriously? Not only does that maybe feel impossible, but it, it, you could even argue it. It's like, how can that be right? 
in this situation where justice needs to be done, right? How can that be right when, when this is stepping all over my toes? How can this be right when, you know, fill that? So, so there's a part of us, and James really unpacked it in chapter one. In our old sin-wrecked flesh, this earthly kind of wisdom resides. This kind of selfish take, this selfish ambition. Listen, ambition, ambition and jealousy are not necessary. They're kind of morally neutral. Ambition can be morally neutral. It's the, throw in the adjective though, selfish ambition, we've got polluted ambition. Bitter jealousy, you know, the passage we're getting to in the most is God is jealous for us. So there can be a godly kind of jealousy polluted by sin. So the problem is that the sin is polluted. It's kind of wrecked us. James said that we are responsible, we're culpable for all of that. And, but then he, he focuses, he, he introduces another adversary. It's like, it's as if it's not enough for sin dwelling in us to, to mess with us. We also have an external adversary, he says. Selfishness and dark impulses do not live in a vacuum. They do not come from God. They're demonic. They come from spiritual realm, dark, set opposed to God, evil, Tactically speaking, the devil majors in two ways to, to trip up humans and, and his desire, believe it or not, is to destroy us. You know what he does? He tempts us. Chapter one says God never tempts us. Guess who does tempt us? The devil tempts us. And the second major tactic is he tries to deceive us. He tries us to buy a lie. He wants to, to put even, you know, there's, there's kind of blinders on to what is true and what is good. That's why he's called the father of lies. We can pull up the tank again. The inflatable. Now you might think, oh, these English troops had supernatural strength. That's impressive. They did not. That's a, that's a rubber inflatable uh, that was used in, in World War II. For those of you that are students of, the, the horrific uh, Second World War D-Day prep, the Allies were trying to deceive the Germans. And this is one of the ways that they tried. When, when real tanks in the cover of darkness would roll away closer to be deployed you know, across the channel and heading for, you know, they didn't wanna know where they're gonna land as well, right? They, they had to, to strategically maneuver them. They put rubber ones in place. So any, you know, kind of reconnaissance checking out from the sky would just see tanks down there still and, and they would think there was no movement. I don't know how well that worked. I think double agents, the historians say, were, were more effective uh, in, in this kind of strategery. Um, but here's the point. If you and I are unaware that we have a deadly enemy Man, that makes us super vulnerable. If we don't know that there's a spiritual realm and that the devil and demons live there and that we're actually targets, then we are at an enormous disadvantage. We're, all, we're, we're not even being deceived as much as we're just like kind of blind to those realities. What if we only vaguely are aware of what's going on there? What we're still super vulnerable because we don't know, we won't know the enemy's tactics. We won't know what to look out for. We'll be kind of, you know, uh, living blindly, if you will. And then to make matters worse, it's like the moment that you get serious about following Jesus, it's like, I'm in, I'm gonna follow Jesus. This, this makes sense. I feel compelled even, this is good. And then we're like, and sign me up for something. By the way, we need lots of people to sign up for things as we head to the fall. Sign me up for something, right? Guess what? There, and we don't even know it's there. There's like a target that kind of grows on us. We become bigger targets. I've been 
trying to walk with the Lord for 40 years and been in communities all the way through. If this sounds a little surreal or, or bizarre or like, is this true? Let me assure you that all of it is so true. And don't believe me so much. The word says it's true. Jesus and, and friends and disciples encountered spiritual opposition and, and demonic level kind of like uh, thoughts and, and, and systems and, and all of that, but also kind of through humans and attacking humans. It's all so real. It's all so real. And so for the moment, let me say, I, I share this not if, if you're like feeling a little uninformed or maybe a little bad about that or like, uh, you know, hey, that's on us to, to teach a bit, right? And to, to offer some things to grow in our ability to navigate this. And we'll, we'll be doing that uh, in the, the near future here. But for now, I want to just mention uh, two things. One, uh, just by way of like, how does this work exactly? Well, this is one way it works. And I don't have time to unpack this, but and, and to make the, the longer, bi bigger, biblical case for it. But man, it's there, but then you see it in experience. Demons can plant thoughts in our minds. So when we talk about our heart, right? Biblically speaking, when we talk about our heart, we're talking about what's happening in our heads, our desires, and volition. It's, it's kind of a three-pack. It's our inner life, right? Well, guess what? Satan can, demons can plant thoughts in our heads, in humans' heads. And for those of you that are like, I'm very familiar with how spiritual warfare works, and I've even heard voices. When people say that, I, I believe them. It can get so bad and kind of so loud that people are actually hearing voices in their heads. And I now know that probably that's almost certainly demonic. It's not everywhere and all over the place and everything, but it's it's. Uh, there a whole lot more. You know, one of the, the strategies, the exceptions that, that Satan has, I believe, for Western cultures, basically in our own, is he's kind of hiding. In other cultures, part of the world, it's just all out there and there's more overt kind of activity because everyone believes in the spiritual realm. Here, it's just kind of underground a little bit because we don't even believe it's real. And man, can he leverage that. He can leverage that big time if we don't even believe we have an enemy if we don't believe that we're vulnerable, if we don't believe that demons are at play sometimes in our families and relation dynamics, in our lives, makes us super vulnerable. Good news is, and we'll get this in a moment, that we do not have to be unaware of the devil's schemes. The word of God primarily informs the Holy Spirit is also speaking to us. So one of our tasks, second application point, right, is in praying, it's like, God, I want to hear your voice, hear you better, because God speaks to our hearts as well. He speaks in all kinds of ways. He's a very good communicator. I didn't realize just how good until I got a little older. And I'm like, my goodness, he's speaking loud and clear. And I just wasn't paying very close attention. All right, let's move to the, the second portion a little faster here. The, the question that, that frames this, this part, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? He goes a little further, talks about this relational dynamic. Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? And the word passion here, by the way, is what, where we get the word hedonism. Um, it's, it's, it's one thing to have good desires. These are polluted desires. These are desires that have checked off, you know, they're off the path. These are infected by sin desires, okay? This is the kind of passions he's talking, warring with what? As believers, it's warring with the Spirit in us. The Holy Spirit's speaking his wisdom download. There's a war. You desire, do not have, so you murder. You covet, cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask, do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions, you adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says, he yearns jealously over the spirit that is made to dwell in us but he gives more grace. Thank God. 
Therefore, it says, God is opposed opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And he sets up the last application point with that. Before we go there, let me just note, in this section, there, there are, again, people into the grammar a little bit. There's 30 verbs crammed into that, <laughs> that paragraph. What's in our hearts, and the reason is he's just, it's all about, hey, look, this is what it looks like. This is what, I, you know. Whatever is in our hearts, percolates in our minds, comes out in our actions. And so this portion is highlighting, and again, we're starting in a, in a pretty bad place, biblically speaking. We're, we're kind of wrecked by sin. God saves us, drops a new, and, and then we're, a new kind of heart in us, right? Take away the heart of stone, drops a heart of flesh, the good kind. And we began in a journey towards godly, on a journey towards these kinds of things not marking our relationships and our lives. So we get to the place again, talked about, how then shall we live? Let's look at the last portion here, James chapter four. I'm gonna read it and then just reflect on it for a moment. There are, there are 10 imperatives, I'll say this fast, there are 10 imperatives in that tiny little section. And if you know what an imperative is, it's the, uh, the voice of command in, in the verbs, the, the Greek verbs. James, not surprisingly, has over 50 verbs in this form in his letter. 10 of them here. Guess where 20 of them live, chapter five. So, so he's kind of backloading all the application, the clear instructions, much heavier at the end of his letter than in the beginning of the letter. But here's what distinguishes this little section from even the 20 verbs in chapter five. This is a, a beautiful intact unit that, that when we break it down, it's gonna jump even more what, what James is doing here. He doesn't just kind of call stuff out and go, and good luck. He actually builds in to his letter, like what to do about it. This is a, if there was a, a portion in the New Testament that said, how do I go from here to there, from kind of being dominated a bit by sin to being filled with the spirit, how do I get there? This is how. It's actually right here, kind of broken down for us, which makes this even more amazing. Let me read it and then we'll break it down. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves, therefore, before the Lord, and he will exalt you. We must learn to fight for true wisdom. So we're gonna take these one at a time. And the first is that we need to submit to God. I'm going to borrow shamelessly from my favorite 19th century preacher named Charles Hans Spurgeon, you might recognize the name, and read how he communicated what it means to submit to the Lord. This advice should not need much pressing. Submit yourselves unto God. Is it not right upon the very face of it? Is it not wise? Does not conscience Tell us that we ought to submit. Does not reason bear witness that it must be the best to do so? Submit yourselves unto God. Should not the creature be submissive to the creator to whom it owes its existence, without whom it had never been and without whose continuous good pleasure it would at once cease to be? Our creator is infinitely good and his will is love. To submit to one who is too wise to err, too good to be unkind, should not be hard. If he were a tyrant, it might be courageous to resist, but since he is a father, it is ungrateful to rebel. He cannot do anything which is not perfectly just, nor will he do aught which is inconsistent with the best interests of our race. Therefore, to resist him is to contend against one's own advantage and like the untamed bullock to kick against the pricks to our own hurt. Submit yourselves to God, it is what angels do. 
what kings and prophets have done, what the best of men delight in. There is therefore no dishonor nor sorrow in doing so. All nature is submissive to his laws. Suns and stars yield to his behest. We shall but be in harmony with the universe in willingly bowing to his sway. Submit yourselves to God. You must do it whether you are willing to do so or not. Who can stand out against the Almighty? For a puny man to oppose the Lord is for the chaff to set itself in battle array with the wind, or for the tow to make a war with the flame. As well might man attempt to turn back the tide of the sea or check the march of the hosts of heaven as a dream of overcoming the omnipotent. The eternal God is irresistible, and any rebellion against his government must soon end in total defeat. Thank you, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, inspired in that moment. Here's the only thing that I'd add to this portion. This is the most important. It's, it's coupled ideally with our putting our faith in Jesus that once and for all, setting our sails to, to God's winds and saying, I'm in, forgive me, I'm following you. That's what should happen in that moment for us where we radically even submit ourselves to God. I think back to the day that I did that all the time. You know what it is for me? It's my safety net under my entire life. I don't question much anymore about what's to come. I don't worry about it much. Why? Because I entrusted my entire existence in life to the one who loves me like that and who has all power. And I said, I'm in. I don't worry so much anymore. If you haven't made that decision yet, there's not a more important application point from this little message than that. How could we not submit ourselves to one who loves us so well, fashioned us? I'm old and I've barely been on the human stage. I've, it's, I've been here for about two seconds. Who in the world am I to say to God the way things are or to trust in my own understanding? I do not trust in my own understanding any longer. I trust in what the word of God says and what he declares. Secondly, we're to resist the devil and he will flee from us. This is the most obvious kind of fight when we think about fighting for, you know, it's like we have to. The only way that we can discern lies is to be familiar with the truth got to be into the word. You've got to be comparing notes. Got to be reflecting on the truth download. Got to be looking carefully, inviting the Lord to search our hearts. We've got to be. Or we will be vulnerable and we might be deceived. It is just that simple. And if I'm not willing to receive correction from a brother or a sister, that's not a good sign. That suggests that I'm pretty confident in my take on all things. And, and that is a reflection, not of humility, but of pride. And so when it comes to resisting the devil, we have a big part to play. The, the beauty is, is when we're kind of aligned with God's ways and we're submitting ourselves to him, believers are safe and sound under his umbrella of protection. Does that mean that in God's sovereignty, he might not allow James to be murdered? I, I, I have a feeling that, that God stayed the hands of James's human enemies many, many times before he finally said, James, it's time to come home. I will allow them to take you out. That's the only time in our battle with the enemy that, that we are not, you know, we would be kind of the umbrella be lifted for a moment as God maybe takes us to glory. Here's the one thing I need to say when it comes to this, uh, resist the devil, he'll flee from you. We are singing it about so awesome before. There is power in the name of Jesus. Whew. If you don't know that, it's true. And the way to, to do battle, if you feel like you're under attack or you wake up in the middle of the night or something, whatever is going on, pray out loud against any of the dark stuff and just say, Jesus name, in Jesus name, help protect, deliver, those kinds of things. That's, again, boiling it down a little, there's, there's some blanks to fill in, but that's the heart of it. 
That is how we resist the devil and he'll flee from us because he has endowed us with his authority and his grace and his love covers us, protects us from the enemy of our soul. Third, we're to draw near, cleanse your hands, purify your hearts. You know what he's just simply saying there? He's just saying, confess your sins as often as you need to. So, so we're submitting to God. We're, we're, we're resisting the devil. He gives us the armor to battle back. We have his word as a sword, by the way, as well. And we need to confess our sins. If, if I am indulging in something, I'm kind of getting off track and I'm not dealing with it. I'm going down a, another trail. I am the... the that I'm making myself vulnerable. I'm like a sheep who wanders away from the flock and I'm out kind of in the, the wilderness rocky portions where wolves are kind of around. I actually am putting myself in a vulnerable position because I have stepped out away from the flock. So we confess our sins. Um, if I'm paying attention at all in my faith, I'm, I'm confessing something every day. So just, to, that's part of normal. Fourth, uh, be sorrowful, mourn, cry, laughter to mourning. Um, was James just kind of sad and, and grumpy a lot or what? I'm like, maybe on some days. But I, I think overall, James knew what joy was. James, I'm sure, would laugh. He would do all of that. What he's getting at here, I think, is so, that sounds like repentance to me. That list right there, he's just saying, and repent, so here it is. It's possible for me to see a sin, to confess it, and then not really repent of it. So next day, guess what? Sliding down in the same ditch. Repentance is harder. Repentance is more challenging than confession. <laughs> Repentance might require me to, to really, like on some level, grieve and mourn that I've been grieving God for a while. It might require me to, to just recognize, you know, spend time with God, recognize that, that I've just been off track. Repentance might mean that I need to then have a plan going forward of how in the world am I gonna avoid sliding in that ditch again? Repentance might mean that I build in accountability because I know that Jesus took my sin seriously and therefore I better take it seriously. So James is saying, be sure to repent. Don't play games, right, with, with sin. Yes, you, you'll stumble and fall again, but man, get up fast and make sure that we have a plan if a particular sin is kicking our butts. And then lastly, uh, humble ourselves. This is synonymous actually with submit to God. To humble ourselves before God simply means that we, are, we, we confess to God that, that we are poverty, <laughs> spiritually speaking, that we need him that we're desperate for him. You know, I love it. He weaves the Beatitudes and, and the Sermon on the Mount everywhere in his letter. He was probably there. You know what it is? It says, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. So the beauty of uh, of a deeper repentance, of, of humbling ourselves before the Lord, not only is that we'll be strengthened to have some victory and we'll, we'll win some, some fights, you know, with even sin within us, but we're gonna be comforted by God as we grieve our own sin or the sin of other people. He will actually comfort us. I wanna finish with a, a poem. Uh, it. I love this poem, have for a long time. By C.S. Lewis, I guess, shouldn't be surprised uh, in light of uh, his, his writing and, and power, his rhetoric. All this flashly, f flashy rhetoric about loving you. I never had a selfless thought since I was born. I'm a mercenary and self-seeking through and through. I want God, you, all friends, merely to serve my turn. Peace, reassurance, pleasure are the goals I seek. I cannot crawl one inch outside my proper skin. I talk of love as scholar's parrot may talk Greek, but self-imprisoned always end where I begin. Only that now you have taught me, but oh, how late my lack. I see the chasm. And everything you are, are was making my heart into a bridge by which I might get back from exile and grow man. And now that bridge is breaking. For this I bless you as the ruin falls, 
the pains you give me are more precious than all other gains. I think what this is late in his life too, I think what he was reflecting on was how challenging all of this is in life. It's challenging to grow in our faith and to grow in holiness, to become men and women who, who are operating with godly wisdom instead of earthly wisdom. It's super challenging. We might get categories and have some understanding in our heads, but man, the day to day looks more like that. So don't be discouraged, but be encouraged that God is more committed to this process than you and I are committed to our own process, which is what the scriptures say. Let's pray together as we approach this table. Uh, but there is more grace, the text said. Lord, we are approaching this table. It's so, it's, the symbolism is so rich. Lord Jesus, your body broken for us, paying for our sins. Your blood shed for us, cleansing us from all our sins. Strengthening us as we, we cry out to you, as we meet with you. Strengthening us. And Lord, we pray as we partake in this meal together, that you would be pleased to fill us up with your spirit. Oh, fill us as we are in a right posture, as we working through what we need to work through, would you please fill us with your spirit? Pray for nothing less. In the strong name of Jesus, amen.